Welcome to the Clinical Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Here in our PCRF Journal Club, we promote evidence-based practices by critically evaluating the latest science in emergency medical services. We hope our discussion will help advance EMS practice. Through the generous support of our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO, we are able to make science more accessible and understandable. All right, welcome everyone to the January 2023 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Special thank you again to our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO for making this possible for us to be here. This is the first podcast of this new year. Glad you all are here with us. Um, I'm Rimley Crow, and today I am joined by Dr. Tony Fernandez, Jeff Rollman, Dr. Bill Toon, and we have with us a special guest, uh, Dr. David Miramontes from San Antonio, who is going to talk with us a little bit about uh, another program that is related to the paper that we're discussing today. And just as a reminder, the name of the article that we are reviewing is The Impact of Administering Buprenorphine to Overdose Survivors Using Emergency Medical Services. This is in Annals of Emergency Medicine, if you want to check out the full article. Um, and as always, this article is going to be, or this discussion will be paired with an article that will come out later in EMS World. And this is a column written by our very own Dr. Tony Fernandez called Journal Watch. So we encourage all of you to check that out. It's under emsworld.com, under education and training. And I want to thank you all one more time for joining us and remind you that as listeners to this live session, you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments. And we're going to be bringing those into the discussion as we go. So we are really excited to, to get moving into this because obviously we have an opioid problem and that's no shock to us, but for the first time in a long time, here's some research telling us that there's something we might be able to do about it and bring some hope to this situation. And so I'm very fortunate and thankful to have Dr. Miramontes here with us and taking the time. And I'm going to turn it over to him actually to share with us a little bit of background on this topic and what they're doing in San Antonio before we dive straight into our paper. So Dr. Miramontes, thank you again. I'm going to stop sharing and pass the power over to you and we'll get started. All righty, howdy. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the opioid use issue. So we know that the overdose deaths are skyrocketing, and that is uh, really a huge problem of the opioid crisis, predominantly because the cartels in Mexico are now producing high-grade fentanyl that is coming instead of heroin. Um, so they can ship more drug at a higher potency into the United States more effectively logistically. Plus, they don't have to grow the heroin poppy. They can just synthesize it in Mexico in labs and chemistry labs and ship it over the border. So this is your brain, and then this is your brain on drugs. Right. So when you're a opioid use disorder patient or person who uses drugs, your stimulation of your dopamine system gets upregulated as part of the, the disease, the chemical imbalance that is caused by opioid use disorder. And so you need this med, you need those opioids just to feel normal. And without those, daily or twice, three times daily injections or use of opioids, you feel terrible. We call it dope sick or in withdrawals. So what about why you just stop using stuff, right? You can't do that. It doesn't work. So this, this um, article by Keiko in the Lancet shows that abstinence uh, type therapy just doesn't work. 20% mortality, 0% abstinence in the first year. It just doesn't work. You've got to use maintenance therapy with buprenorphine or methadone in order to get these people through the first year. And so they can address all their other issues, mental health, safe housing, food, security, all those things that are pay a role uh, in their addiction. And so what we're going to talk about a little bit about is harm reduction. So what's this harm reduction thing? What kind of woke weirdo thing is that? It's not. You can't save someone if they're dead. Okay, you can't help someone through their addiction if they're dead. So what you have to do is do those things, prevent overdose deaths using Narcan therapy, referral to treatment, 
buprenorphine, methadone, whatever it is. Also, by doing therapy, you're going to decrease infections and wounds from IV drug abuse. This uh, picture is an example of someone who's been shooting in their staph in his vein, uh, in their ankle. And with the new uh, xylene thing you've heard about, these wounds are disgusting um, and real prevalent. And you see the xylazine mostly in the East Coast, but that's an issue. A lot of these folks get pregnant while they're addicted to narcotics. And you actually, in treatment, the moms and babies do better if they're on therapy because they're getting a consistent dose. They're not withdrawing and using, plus they don't have to inject. So you're lowering your risk to um, other diseases that happen. It decreases 911 resources. What a better reason to do this. It cuts the number of calls you have to go to. So giddy up, get going. And it lowers HIV in the community, lowers hep C. It's a crime reduction model because they don't have to use steel pimp or pander in order to try and get drug. Decreases use of high-risk needle use, and it actually gets these people into our healthcare environment for primary healthcare, cancer screening, hepatitis C treatment, et cetera. And if they get into treatment, guess what? It's a benefit to the community because they go back to school, go back to work, and they get in a stable environment and maybe even go off public assistance. So it's a win, 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 win. You can't save one somebody if they're dead. You can't get them off drugs if they're dead. So what do we do? So um, in the study we're gonna talk about, we're gonna use a, a simple med, uh, it's called buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone. It's a, a strip like the Listerine strips you buy at the store. It's a um, ODT. You just put the strip underneath your, between your cheek and gum and boom, it gets absorbed and bingo, you get the immediate effects of buprenorphine. And what this is doing is substituting the narcotic for the Suboxone and it's different. So when you do that, we have to use Suboxone. You have to use a clinical opioid withdrawal scale. This is how dope sick are you? How much in withdrawals are you? A little bit, a lot, oh my God, right? So this is how we can quantify that. And we, in, my, in the study, you'll see they used a, a higher cow score. In my practice, we start around four or five, especially for high risk. If they're that sick, they need drug. So what are the drugs available? We have methadone. Methadone is only available by federally subsidized treatment centers through the Substance Abuse Administration, SAMHSA. And these are um, these spots are almost always filled in a community, federally funded. Some people have to pay because they don't um, they don't qualify for Medicaid. Um, and like in in Texas, we don't have expanded Medicaid, so they got to pay cash if they're going to be in this program. So that is a full on agonist. So that means if you take your methadone dose and then use a little heroin or a little Vicodin, you can overdose and die. Methadone is a tricky med. It has to be titrated up slowly. There's issues with prolonged QT, torsades, all kinds of issues. So methadone is a real tricky med you have to do. It can only be done in those kind of treatment facilities. And they have to go every day for drug. Um, they can get take-home privileges later on, but you have to go every day to get dosed. Buprenorphine, on the other hand, has a ceiling. In other words, it's an agonist antagonist. It takes the receptor, grabs it, and then, oh, narcotics, you can't come on the receptors because I got it. It is so tightly bound to the narcotic receptor that it's almost impossible to overdose. You can't open an overdose on buprenorphine, and you can't, if you take other narcotics, you're probably not going to get high, and you're not going to overdose. So it gives us this lasting effect, and it's a really safe drug. It is now available uh, for prescription, family practice, nurse practitioners, anybody can do it. And the X waiver has been discontinued by the Biden administration. So it's even easier to get folks on it, even from a primary care physician's office. And then the other drug that is used is naltrexone. Naltrexone is Narcan on crack. So what it does is it binds a receptor, blocks it. And you can't, even if you use, it's not going to take effect. So this is more... Um, this is used for people that can't use mind-altering drugs in their therapy. For example, lawyers, doctors, nurses, um, truck drivers, things like that. So this may be the only option uh, for those types of patients that are in therapy. But this drug is problematic because you do get cravings, you do get some of the withdrawal effects, um, and but it just enforces sobriety. Uh, not the best way to go for some people. 
So I told you about this ceiling effect. This is a great drug for EMS. Buprenorphine um, has this ceiling effect. So it's like you can overdose them, right? So it has an agonist effect. In other words, it goes on the receptor, makes you get out of withdrawals. It has pain reduction properties. Suboxone is used for pain management in some cases. And it blocks those receptors so you can't overdose. So it provides that level of, sec of um, security also for these patients. And also, it's it, you can't really, uh, it's hard to abuse this as a process. So everyone knows that this is available on the street. People are buying it illicitly, trying to use it when they can't get heroin or fentanyl. So what our program is, as you'll find out, is very different. We'll talk about that later. But what are some outcomes in San Antonio? Well, we started the program here. We had a shutdown during COVID. And we do a combination of Narcan distribution and MAP. Uh, that's medically assisted treatment. A lot of the patients that we contact are still using, and so we, they're not eligible for the Suboxone protocol. We'll talk about that when we go through this paper. But we do refer them on uh, to uh, treatment through our partners and our grant-funded slots. Um, what do we know? If we start people on, on um, naltrexone, they get better quickly. While we're there, their withdrawal symptoms disappear they immediately get better. And if we have to treat them over a weekend, for example, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, their cal scores go remarkably down to the point where they're pretty comfortable on day two and three, don't have cravings, aren't apt to use, and then they're ready to engage in their treatment process. So this is a drug that EMS can make them better quicker and get them focused on recovery. Because when you're in withdrawals, all you care about is I need drug. And you'll do anything to stop feeling so terrible from withdrawals. And that's what this drug does, immediate treatment for that therapy. Um, and so we get people in uh, and we can keep them in recovery. So a good portion of patients stay in the recovery process at 30, 60, 90 days. And this there, this uh, paper will discuss that as well. So you get them feeling good, you get them engaged and referred, and hopefully they stay into treatment to low for harm reduction that we talked about, because you can't make people better if they're dead. And again, even with our recovery coaches, our peer counselors, these are people who used to use drugs that are now peer counselors. So they have life experience with this process. That is a critical step in getting people engaged in recovery. And that's all I got. Thank you. That's a lot of really helpful background on what we're seeing here um, and what we're going to be talking about in today's paper. And so I'm going to pop back up our slides here and we can dig into a little bit about what the authors sought to do. So their goal in this particular paper was to take a program and analyze the efficacy and safety of having EMS administer this medication, buprenorphine, after an overdose, so after responding to a patient who has overdosed and where they've administered naloxone. And they were interested in looking at things like treating the withdrawal symptoms, reducing repeat overdose, and providing a next day substance use disorder clinic appointment to initiate that long-term treatment. And something that you brought up, Dr. Miramontes, that I think is so important as we discuss something like opioid use disorder is that you know, it's not just this one and done treatment or that we hand out a piece of paper and say, you know, stop using opioids, that's not going to be effective ever. We have to address this web of social determinants of health. And you know, the buprenorphine is the, the key to the door to start addressing that more complex web. And it's, it's much more challenging than simply medication over them. <laughs> like so many long-term health conditions, but this is a bit of a paradigm shift where we're considering opi opioid use disorder as the true illness that it is and you know, accepting that we need long-term treatments to go with that. Right. Um, so you don't tell a diabetic, just don't eat sugar or carbs. Have a nice day. Right. And you don't take away their insulin when they do. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think that's a really big mental model shift for us. And I'm glad that we're able to look at this study because this is a this is a unique program as well. And we'll talk about some of the differences between how we're looking at uh, opioid use disorder in this program in San Antonio versus this setting, which was in Camden, New Jersey. And Tony, I want to turn it over to you a little bit to talk about the methods before we dive into exactly what they did and the actual results. But it's important to understand you know, where the study took place and what kind of study it was. So perhaps you can fill us in on some of those details around how the authors took on this question. Yeah, so this was a really interesting study. So <clears throat> this was a, a, a matched uh, study, and they looked at patients 
needing um, needing a naloxone induced clinical opiate withdrawal scale of at least five or more um, in order to be included in the study. And they had to be opioid free for 72 hours uh, prior to the overdose for inclusion, which I thought was um, an interesting uh, inclusion criteria uh, just to be able to tease that out from the patient, I think um, uh, is worth worthy of note. Um, they use the cow scale and we'll talk about the cow scale a bit, uh, but this is the clinical opioid withdrawal scale, opiate withdrawal scale. And this is an 11 point scale, uh, um, 11, it has 11 um, uh, factors that it looks into. Things like resting pulse rate, sweating, tremors, uh, GI upset. Um, they look at restlessness, pupil size, uh, uh, bone and joint aches, runny nose, and the th and and the like. So it's a it's there there it is on the screen. So it's a zero to forty eight uh, scale. And in this study, uh, well, just overall, as we had up earlier, about a five to twelve is considered mild, whereas a thirteen to twenty four is moderate. And then anything that's thirty six or above is considered severe withdrawal. And in the study we're going to look at today, uh, folks had to have a cow score of five or greater uh, for inclusion. It was and I think this goes to reinforce uh, how uncomfortable opioid withdrawal is. You know, I sometimes I've heard old dogma and people, oh, well, you know, it's just withdrawal. This is a very uncomfortable situation. And then that combined with the craving makes you're willing to do a lot of things to make that feeling disappear. And so it's nice to have this scale that lets us quantify what stage in this process is the patient in. And then again, with buprenorphine, we're looking to relieve that discomfort and to move forward to the path to recovery. I think it's really important to say a cow score of 14, you say is moderate, not mm -hmm. to the patient. They're miserable. They're vomiting. They have diarrhea. They're sweating. Everything they're hurts. Their hair hurts. That's what they'll tell you. So these a cow score of 10 or 14, that's your that that's a man flu level of sickness, right? You're sick. Um, and especially if you're homeless, you know, having diarrhea on this and being homeless, that's a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And as a testament to that, uh, Dr. Biamondis, you were saying earlier, you used a score of about four. Um, and in this current study, they use a score of five, which is really at the lower end of what the originators of the score uh, 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 used it to uh, interpret these scores. So I think that um, to your point, this is this is certainly uncomfortable for the patients, and uh, the the sooner we can initiate further treatment, the better. Absolutely. So let's talk about where the study took place exactly. Uh, yeah. So the study the study was uh, from August uh, 2019 to December 2020, and it took place in New Jersey. Um, let me pull up the exact uh, settings uh, that we had in New Jersey, but this was um, it was really interesting how. They went about the study. They had, um, they were in New Jersey, and they uh, it was one system in New Jersey that that transports to multiple different uh, receiving facilities. And right, and I think the the time frame is something to call out here. So the fact that this did take place over the year that shall not be named. Uh, is, is an important consideration. So we know that things were changing with how opioids were being used during the pandemic and that the proportion of overdoses that were fatal actually increased as we saw things like social distancing and people using alone. So the setting for this is important to keep in mind as we go into the results and as we see the number of patients that were encountered during the study period. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, one of the interesting things about this study is how they dispatched. Uh, so they had um, they had ambulances that had uh, buprenorphine on, on board, and then they had ambulances that did not. And if they got dispatched for an overdose, they did not um, preferentially select the ambulances with the medication. Uh, they 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 just sent as as they would, and it made for a really nice natural experiment uh, to to determine the the difference in 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 patients' experience after you when you send an ambulance with these resources and when you don't. Um, I thought that that was very interesting, and it's also interesting that as they they started equipping more ambulances um, with buprenorphine, and they were able to as the study went on more and more patients were able to see a provider that had these extra medical resources um, 
just because one, the increase in number of of overdose calls, and two, more ambulances actually did have uh, were equipped with the medication as the study period went on. And that's something I really admire about this study is that they put on that improvement science lens or they put on that implementation science lens and said, you know, we're not going to just roll it out to every single ALS unit at once. They actually rolled it out to one unit to start with and probably learned some things that they ended up adapting before they scaled it up to the five units. So this system, it sounds like, had five ALS units that ultimately got the intervention, but that happened gradually over a period of 13 months. And it enabled them to do a, a few different types of analyses. So they were able to first compare uh, the patient's uh, experience when they have an ambulance that was uh, equipped with the medication when they didn't. And then they were able to dive down into the analysis a little more and look at among those who, who had an ambulance with the medication on board, what were the experiences of patients who actually did receive the drug and those who didn't. Um, and they were able to do some really sophisticated analyses with their matching uh, so that we can really understand the true um, impact of this program. Absolutely. So let's talk about a little bit about their protocol and what it took to be included in this study. So this was, you already mentioned that there were patients that were encountered by ambulance and who were determined to be having an overdose and they received naloxone. And what else did the authors mention that needed to happen in order for these patients to be eligible for the actual intervention? Yep, so they had to have, and they had to be opioid free for 72 hours prior. Uh, they had to have a CAO score of five and they had to, uh, they, they did have some exclusion criteria, which I thought were, uh, were interesting. Um, was, were there uh, other inclusion criteria that, um, that you wanted me to mention, Dr. Pro? Nope, those were the ones. And then talking about how Dr. Miramontes mentioned the medication methadone, and this was an important part of the exclusion criteria. So if the patient had had methadone within 48 hours, they were not eligible to be included in this particular intervention at that exact time. Yeah, and they, they had a couple other uh, exclusions. I thought the methadone was, was an interesting one. Um, they excluded pregnant patients as well as patients that were under 18 um, or and were unwilling to provide their name, date of birth, and the like. So they excluded patients who there was no way they could um, actually track and, and link data later on for the analyses. Absolutely. And the authors of this study had a previous publication as a case series in pre-hospital emergency care, and that's where I took the graphic that we're displaying right now. But this is just to give an idea of an example protocol. And I, I think it would be helpful to hear because there are several of these programs across the country, and we're lucky enough to have a person who is very intimate uh, with the procedure in San Antonio. So I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, what, how the process looks a little bit different? What are the similarities between San Antonio and this process from New Jersey in the paper? Yeah, so a couple, I wanna jump in real quick on the inclusion criteria. It, yeah. On the paper, it said a cow score of five or after drug uh, use or not mm -hmm. having meds in 72 hours, right. okay? And the methadone exclusion is really an important one. Methadone has a half-life of many, 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 many days. So they're going to have drug on board. If you give Suboxone, buprenorphine, and a patient has methadone in the receptors, you're going to precipitate withdrawal. So you actually cause harm. That's why that methadone exclusion is in there. So they used it in, in this protocol, it's cal score greater than seven. And in the paper, it was five for that study period. Um, <clears throat> What the, this protocol is very unique, and they did a great job of this. I just, I wish I could do this in my shop. So what they did is patients that overdosed, they woke them up with Narcan. So they got two, four, six milligrams of Narcan or naloxone. So now all their re opioid receptors are bound by naloxone, which means they're in full-blown withdrawals, right? There's no question that every receptor is now occupied by, by Narcan, okay? So now their call scores are high, they're sick, they're vomiting, um, they're, they're sick, sick, sick. And then what this protocol did is they gave, oh, I can make you better. I'm gonna give you Suboxone that's gonna knock off all that Narcan, but also get you out of withdrawals. So this is a just-in-time treatment 
at the time of the overdose, or if they were not using for three days, um, then they could end in withdrawals, then they could give them the meds. So this is exactly very different than what we do in San Antonio. We don't do it on our first out ambulances because I got 40 something ambulances. I ain't got, I don't got the bandwidth for that. Plus, I don't have the beds to send these people to. I can only do two or three a day, maybe, because of the infrastructure of follow-up. This program, they had basically open-ended resources for the patients to follow up in 24 and 48 hours, which is absolutely fantastic. I have to babysit patients over the weekend or holiday because our treatment centers aren't open. So the difference is, is that they were doing at the time of overdose or if they were in withdrawals. And that is just a great way to do this because you're getting the patient engaged at their time of greatest need. We in San Antonio give referrals or we go find them after their overdose, after the fact. So um, not as elegant of a process, really a great model. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is an important distinction because there are a lot of these rapid response teams or you're starting to see these cross-functional teams, but they are coming back a day or maybe 72 hours after the, what I would call the index event, which is the overdose. And so being able to initiate the, the treatment right there at that moment is what will be interesting to see when we get into the results, how effective that actually is, because um, that is an important moment to intervene in. A lot of our patients, we can't indu- use the Suboxone because they've used. Right. So they've used that morning. They've used the night before. They got methadone off the street. Um, I took some oxys. So with Suboxone, you have to be in full-blown withdrawal with a cow score of four or you know, five, seven, whatever your right. threshold is. You have to be in withdrawals and you can't have had methadone in the previous 72 hours. So this study actually is a better application of the drug use um, for buprenorphine. It's just elegant. Absolutely. And when we get into the results, I think this cow score is so important because it paints a real picture of what's happening to that human in their moment of crisis. And so the, it, to me, also points out what we can do with naloxone. Yes, we saved a life, but we've also plunged them into a painful point on that cow scale. And so that doesn't give us free reign to just give all of the naloxone either. We've talked about titrating to effect and you know being judicious about how much we're administering and by what routes this paper talks about how on their BLS units, naloxone is given primarily intranasally, which probably has a different rate than when it is given by ALS. And they said intramuscularly from the ALS team, but you could also think about what would happen if we were to give that medication IV. Um, so all of this just to say that we should be thinking about what are the effects of our medication beyond just the immediate reversal of the overdose and what effects that have on the withdrawal process. And so with that, let's talk a little bit more about the methods. So a couple of other things that we need to highlight, and I'll turn it back to Tony for yours, and then I have a couple, of course. Um, And then we will dive right into the results and see how this program actually functioned during the study period. Yeah, I thought that this was really interesting how they sectioned out um, their overall call. So they they have some some introduction of, of results in their method section, but it is important to understand that during the study period, they had uh, over 1,800 opioid overdoses, uh, ALS encounters. Um, and they had uh, overall quite a few, um, about 1,200 of those were treated by uh, buprenorphine equipped ambulances, uh, and 611 were treated by the non uh, equipped ambulances. So there, they were, as we were talking about earlier, the, the longer the study period went on, the more likely they were to actually encounter an ambulance that was equipped with this medication. And I thought that it was really interesting how they collected and abstracted their data. So they were able to link data with multiple data sources, um, which I thought was fascinating. So they um, they had data that were linked within 24 hours for Cooper University Healthcare, where they were able to get data directly from the EPCR. Uh, and that was that was interesting because when they went to their other receiving facility, 
um, they had to, they couldn't actually match directly with a medical record number. They had to actually do some probabilistic matching where they used name, date of birth, and the like um, to to link their to link their data. So I thought that um, this is this is was no easy task uh, to link data. We we're we're starting to in EMS we're starting to crack the the nut, so to speak, of uh, linking outcome data and hospital data in an individual encounter. Um, but it is it is infinitely hard to continue to link data throughout the continuum of care over time for a patient. And um, they were able to do that and do that successfully. So I, I did want to point that out and commend the authors on that. Yeah, and I think that's an important piece to see that with these kinds of research projects, it's showing how EMS is part of the larger healthcare continuum and the need to be able to link not just throughout the entire encounter, but also across encounters. And it talked also, in addition to the hospital data, how they were able to obtain data from the clinic. And again, this was a key component of this intervention is that the agency was able to get an appointment with a follow-up clinic, a substance use disorder clinic, for the same or the next business day. And that's a key piece when you're initiating a new treatment that that treatment's not the cure for opioid use disorder, that treatment's helping. And then addressing some of those other root causes and the social determinants of health that go into this is so important. Yep, and they they were they made some adjustments um, to their analysis based on the availability of, of of data, and that is certainly in in a study like this you'd anticipate some missing data, and they they did have some uh, that they dealt with, but I thought they dealt with that successfully, and um, yeah, I think that the that the way they abstracted data and the way they did their analysis was was impressive and certainly suitable for uh, a, a paper with this um, with this objective. Absolutely. And we will now move into the results a little bit. I'm going to invite the other panelists to come on as they will if, if they have questions or comments to add and invite the audience again to through the Q&A submit your own questions and comments, but it's the drum roll moment right what we've been waiting for. Let's talk about what were the results of this great intervention. So I'm going to show figure one here from the paper, and that's just to give us an idea again of the sample size. So this was a unique setting, and they mentioned some uh, details regarding the socioeconomic status of where this happened and the rate of opioid overdose EMS encounters was rather high. Uh, so ultimately, they did see 18 or 1,800 opioid overdose ALS encounters with naloxone administration, and then they creatively created case and control group to allow fair comparison. So of those patients who were encountered by a buprenorphine equipped ambulance, they included 117 cases, 74 of which actually received the medication. And then they matched that with 123 control cases. And so table one just goes through, or figure one rather, just goes through that, whereas table one shows us how comparable were these groups in terms of demographic and clinical characteristics. And so you can see that actually between the two groups, things were pretty well balanced when it comes to things like the sex of the patient, the age of the patient, race and ethnicity, some of the comorbidities, which as Tony mentioned, they were able to obtain that from their hospital record information that they were able to link. Um, insurance coverage, important indicator. And then their primary outcomes. And we'll go into these more in depth, but th this is the important piece of this was looking at who was in treatment within 30 days, overdoses within the next 24 hours, and then an overdose within seven days. Those were the primary outcomes. And I guess we'll have a spoiler moment for Dr. Miramontes. Oh, I was just gonna say, this is really amazing that they got this data. And the reason is. why is that in the, uh, the medication assisted treatment space, methadone clinics, outpatient substance abuse clinics, they are bound by a much higher privacy standard by federal law beyond IPA. So the fact that they were able to tackle this, get this data through that very complicated web, it's one of the, the hard things in my place of, of finding out well, what happened to them. Um, so the elegant job of doing this. Absolutely. And we have a great comment from Christopher in our audience talking about if we have any idea how involved street paramedics were in the research or if they were just part of the data collection and talking about why there were more and more buprenorphine ambulances over time. 
that that doesn't appear to be random. And that's absolutely correct. It wasn't random. It was part of the design. So they initially launched one ambulance with this medication. And again, it's part that we didn't mention in the methods, but is so important is that they had really tight integration with their medical direction team. And they had access to a physician during these encounters to determine are we at the appropriate place to administer this medication? And is this going to likely be successful? Um, so intentionally, they rolled out that first ambulance and left it out there for a period of time. And the goal for this was to learn as much as they could and say, do we need to change the protocol at all? And we saw between the author's first case series where they were using a cows of seven, they actually made some tweaks to the protocols and lowered that to a cows of five. Uh, and I imagine that there were other uh, tweaks that got made to the protocols before they decided to scale this up to all five ALS ambulances. So this helped them learn a lot and mitigate any potential negative consequences before they scaled up large. And now with regards to street paramedics, not that's not mentioned explicitly in this paper, but I'd be curious with you, Dr. Miramontes, what interaction do you have with your frontline clinicians and what's the feedback process like for a program like this, especially in its early phases when you were just rolling it out? Yeah, so like, again, our, the process is very different. This is a protocol based. In my system, you have to call me. And I go over every case. So um, that's another rate limiting step of this process is what do you need to get this going? Um, <clears throat> I think that the way that they did this with that rollout also tested the backside, which is the clinics that are going to receive these patients for ongoing care. You can't just go, boom, here's 50 patients, right? They ramped this up slowly so that as that flow of patients came in on the backside uh, to the clinics in their, their system, they, that was an elegant way of doing this. I don't know if they've done it on purpose. Um, it sounds like they did the trial purpose, but the way they ramped it up actually is a great way to get things going so that the back end receiving the peer counselors, the substance abuse treatment centers, the pharmacies involved, that they can ramp up their resources as the patients start coming through. Absolutely. And it also, so from an improvement science standpoint, this idea of test it small first is really important because it helps you find those unforeseen circumstances. So the balancing measures, we often call them. Uh, and one of the ones that actually gets mentioned later in the paper is the time spent on scene. And Dr. Miramont, as you mentioned, yeah, I can't take my units out forever. And so something that they were watching really closely here is if we are going to pause and take the time to initiate treatment on scene, well, exactly how long are we taking the unit out of service? And are there any other unforeseen consequences that happened after we rolled this out? And so they fortunately found out they weren't spending too much additional time. It gives a couple of minutes were added to this, but that's a really key component when you're thinking about system design and, and the effects of such an intervention. And that's not what we do in San Antonio. We have a special right. community paramedics that go out. They're on overtime, they're on a grant. They're all funded. Um, we don't use our operational units right now. Right. But and if you were again, gonna scale it up to an operational unit, you'd surely wanna test that. <laughs> all right, thanks for the questions and keep them coming in. And now into the results. So the first results that we always look at in a paper like this are the unadjusted results. And we saw that fortunately the groups were pretty well balanced. So in terms of the comparisons, there wasn't too much that they needed to adjust for. And what they did find out in the unadjusted analyses is that there were greater odds of engaging in that opioid use disorder treatment within 30 days of an EMS encounter for the group that saw the buprenorphine equipped ambulance. And so we're talking about an odds ratio of 5.6, which in epidemiology terms is something you shout from the rooftops, that's a really big deal to see that kind of effect. And then we look at the confidence intervals, it doesn't overlap with one. So we say that's not only clinically relevant, that's statistically significant too. And then we can move into the next couple of tables and we'll see some of their adjusted analyses. Uh, and so these again are looking at the characteristics of patients who are exposed and not exposed to that intervention. And then moving into table four, we can look at the association with the primary outcomes this time adjusted. And interestingly, the adjusted odds ratio gets even bigger. So when you control for some of those other things that could have affected this intervention, we actually see more of an effect saying that this treatment worked to get more people into lasting treatment within 30 days. Um, and the other important piece here when we talk about overdose 
there was no increase in overdose among those patients. And so that was another important measure they were considering is, are we seeing repeat visit for an overdose within the next 24 hours, which is a, a very vulnerable time window in the literature, lots of evidence to support that. But they also looked within seven days, so a little bit longer time period. And again, and, no differences there. And if I, anything, the trend would be towards less overdose. Yep. And I just want to highlight how impressive that is that they were able to follow the same patient, not just for 24 hours, but for seven days uh, to, yeah. to make sure that they didn't overdose again. That is, um, I mean, well done. Kudos to the authors. That's Especially hard. since this patient population may not be housed. They yeah. may be homeless um, and, you know, couch surfing or in some type of other environment. So the fact they were able to do that is amazing. Now, Emily, there's a big point here. What they didn't see is a decrease in overdoses in the patient being treated by Suboxone. And they can't explain that. Um, you would think, logically, that patients that are covered with Suboxone early would have a lower overdose rate than those that are not. And we don't know why. So I think, you know, looking at the paper, statistically, they didn't see a difference. That's absolutely true. And interestingly, though, if you look at the raw numbers, the number of overdoses in that population was actually very low to start with. So finding statistical significance in such a small sample was going to be very challenging. But when we look at the odds ratios, if you look at the point estimates for overdose in the next 24 hours, you actually see a 0.28, meaning that those in the suboxone group were less likely to experience an overdose. Now that confidence interval is again, pretty wide at 0.02 to 3.2. Uh, so statistically, no, that's not significant, but looking at the point estimate, it does show the trend in the direction we'd expect. And then if you go to the seven day mark, similarly, we see the point estimate is 0.5. And so any odds ratio less than one favoring the suboxone group as protective. Um, but again, they weren't able to reach statistical significance, though the 95% confidence interval there went up to 1.65. So again, considering the whole of this, I would say this is going in the direction that we would anticipate. It's just not a big enough sample yet. All right. Now I want to bring in the other panelists and have them ask some questions, but a couple of points that, you know, now we're, we're at this discussion aspect. We have these really excellent findings. So what do we do with them after reading this? Well, do we just go roll it out to all of our ambulances? Probably not. Um, it's something that is very local context dependent and worth considering. Something that we didn't talk about necessarily in the methods or that we could dig into a little further is the type of training that has to go along with this. So having the EMTs and the paramedics trained in the use of this medication and also the why behind this medication. So the authors of this study talked a lot about how they conducted that treatment prior to rolling out this, inter that, that education prior to rolling out this intervention. And um, I would be curious to know also in San Antonio, what kinds of education are provided for the trucks that are going to provide this kind of service? Yeah, so we have an eight-hour day where we go over um, all the MIH stuff because our MIH medics work overtime, actually. Um, and they come from all areas of our department, fire prevention, uh, suppression services, EMS. Um, the, everyone's open for overtime in these environments. So we have at least a two or three hour training just on Narcan, substance abuse, buprenorphine, along with the other things like homelessness, uh, that kind of stuff, right? So it's a big lift, but we have a, a core group of folks. I mean, it's not all 800 of my paramedics. It's like 40, right? So it's a tight knit group. And in my world, they have to call me or one of my partners. So it's a direct physician medic interaction. So they did a great job with training. And I look in the results too. They didn't make anybody sick. They, the precipitate yeah. withdrawal thing was like Zippo. So that's great. They did a good job at applying this med because you can, if you don't, if you give med to the wrong person, you can make them sick. The good news is you can make them better by giving more Suboxone and treat them on the scene, but you still don't like to do that to patients. Absolutely. I think that's a key piece. And I love that you highlighted that close interaction between the clinical care team on the front line and the physician medical director. That was a key piece of this study as well, it sounded like. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that in their training, they also included some education and some on-site visits around counseling. And so 
getting blending across fields, right? EMS always sits at that interesting intersection between public health, healthcare, and public safety. But here, maybe we add another point to that social work. And this is an, an important point to understand therapeutic communication and what to expect when convincing somebody or encouraging somebody to join this kind of recovery treatment versus you know, the, the burnout response to, well, I have to do this again, right? Or go to this same patient again and again. This is actually, uh, I would say it would be an anti-burnout fighter because it's an encouraging message where we could actually affect long-term recovery outcomes. Jeff. Hello. Yes, I, I was just also very impressed with the study and reading about what they're doing in Camden um, and have been doing for a couple of years. So very impressed and very interesting to watch this. And now being in San Antonio and watching Dr. Miramontes, who's led this program for the past several years, also very impressive um, that we're able to provide all these resources to our communities. I mean, it's very difficult as a paramedic going out on these calls, often repeat patients and uh, not being able to do much other than reverse that overdose or take them to the ED and see them again. And here we can truly just get them, um, meet them where they're at since we can't help them if, if they're dead, as Dr. Mimontes was saying. Um, I was also very interested here in looking at their refusal rates. So I know they talked about in Camden that initially they were taking around 85% of opioid overdose patients to the ER, so transporting almost all of them. And then at the same time, more and more were refusing. And we've found um, over the years in some studies that yes, these patients are very high risk, but at the same time, patients, if they meet certain criteria, um, it's I don't want to say it's okay to leave them at home, but uh, a lot of them, um, it, it is something that's becoming more and more of an accepted practice. But here, it's really terrific that they're able to have that option in Camden, and they can get them into treatment in the next, uh, within the next 24 hours. And seeing here that there is that um, option of being able to just help that patient out on scene without having to take them to the ER, I think is terrific. I think that's a key point is getting the patient to the right resource at the right time. And you know, is the ER the right resource for everybody? And the answer to that is probably no, especially for something that is complex and requires continued treatment. Great point. Exactly. Yeah. And what I also thought was great here and what we also do in San Antonio. So every single one of these patients is um, the paramedic on scene is having a physician consult with the on-call medical director that even though buprenorphine is a pretty safe medication, we definitely want to make sure that it's only going to these correct patients. We meet those inclusion criteria. We don't have those um, exclusion criteria present and that paramedics are trained to be ready for if that is a sick patient. Um, we have um, in our protocols here in San Antonio, there's other medications we can give if that patient is really sick, since we definitely want to be ready um, that these patients who have very high cow scores, they might still have very high cow scores. They might need additional buprenorphine um, in addition to other medications as well to combat some of those symptoms so that we can really be putting them in a better place and meeting them where they're at. Absolutely. And that in this study, we forgot to mention, that's a great point that you bring up that the protocol also allowed for administration of uh, Zofran along with the buprenorphine to help manage those symptoms and help relieve some of that discomfort during this process. And that's an important piece of this. And, and that it's not a harm-free medication, as you mentioned, there is, there's important clinical considerations and having that broader care team involved is also key. And Dr. Toon, the education perspective. Oh, I was just going to say a point there and leave them with some alcohol preps, you know, for that nausea control. So alcohol preps may work as well. I think we that's, saw an RCT out of San Antonio on that. Yeah, that's <laughs> why I brought that up. You know, those radical people there in Texas, you know, matter of fact, yeah. you're, you're all down there. So I love this. See, I believe that our goal, first of all, I like the education and it continues to talk about how important it is for something to be successful is to make sure 
that the providers that will be providing the direct care have a really comprehensive understanding of what they're they're doing and that they get the follow up to that so they can you know continue to grow from that and this is a this is a view there's certainly you know I still am, I still personally am challenged by the principle of a community paramedic program uh, I understand in principle but to me this is where I want to see the work done is by the person seeing the patient the very first time to be able to do something meaningful, to be able to, and in this case, is it, it, it will be nice if we can change the system, as you say, to match people to the correct resource where they need to go. Not everyone needs to go to an emergency department, you know, and the ability to grow this. The other thing is, is that it's important that it's manageable. You know, they did start small and then grew as their experience came, changed and just a lot of very good things in the study. So if if nothing else, it's a very there's a lot of good methodologies that they did here. And then the other thing, which I know makes you probably very happy, Remley, mm -hmm. is they did have very good data streams here. So they were able to collect very valuable data. And I think it that is something that is still a challenge for many EMS agencies, not the big ones. I'm talking about the majority of what EMS is, is not large agencies. And how do they utilize and incorporate their data and learn from it so they can make their system stronger? So it's, it's a very good program. So I, I loved it. I want to, I think everyone's comments have been spot on and everything like that. And uh, it, it also shows that to me, primary EMS education needs more of these topic areas covered and not in a glancing blow, you know, oh, <laughs> right. uh, there's, there's people that live on the street. Okay, next thing we'll talk about head trauma. You know, we, we need to be preparing. I've always felt the curriculum should truly prepare the people for what's expected of them in the field. And it's that's not right. always the acute care patient. So that's I absolutely. think that that's something we, could, we need to work on in the future. Those are some key points on how we need to be going upstream with our education effort and, and preparing people for the real world. I think the practice analysis that came out not too long ago would suggest that this is certainly a large part of EMS encounters in a lot of areas, not just New Jersey, not just San Antonio. So it's something we should be prepared for. And now they say time flies when you're having fun and certainly have had a lot of fun discussion today. So I, I know that we're getting towards the end, but I wanna take a couple moments and turn it back to Dr. Miramontes. I'd, I'd like to hear some key takeaways or some words of advice, you having lived this process in your own setting on you know, what should we take from this if we were looking to implement this as a new program at an agency? What are, what are some of those best practices or lessons learned? Yeah, so first of all, I'm gonna say, hey, you rural folks that don't live in the big cities, you can do this. You just need a champion physician, a clinic or a physician that's willing to take the patients. And you could probably fund this in operations with on-duty crews, with one of your supervisors doing, you know, duties as acquired. So yes, rural America, small town um, volunteer ambulance. Yes, you can do this. You just need the backside. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. You need to start treating patients, yes, but you need to be able to move them to the next step. Peer counselors, someone who was a substance abuse disorder patient that can connect with that person as a team member um, to try and get them through the process. You need a treating facility, counseling. You need to address those socioeconomic determinants of health. So you need to have that backbone of services. That's where community medicine paramedics really shine because they have that experience because that's what they do every day. But that's not to say that you can't do this in a rural environment, a volunteer agency, as long as you have those systems in place going downstream. And Suboxone is not expensive. It's $8 a strip. So you're, you're talking about 24 bucks. So you use a tube of glucagon, right? Or a vial of glucagon, that's 170 bucks. That's nowhere near the same thing. So you can do that. So first of all, you have to train your people. You have to have a system in place where you get those patients to the next step. You have to have active medical direction and the availability offline and online so you can make the right decision when weird stuff comes up. Don't be afraid. So the ASAP, the American College of Emergency Physicians Protocol, 
is four, wait a couple hours, give another four. We ain't got time for that, right? As the meme says, we do 16, 24, 36 milligrams of Suboxone. Go big or go home. And this study showed us that not only is it effective, it's safe. So this protocol, the go big or go home protocol actually works. And I think that you, again, the big thing is, is why do you want to do this? You can't help somebody if they're dead. You can't help somebody if they have hepatitis C or HIV. So go ahead, get a champion. Go hook up with your peer groups that are already in town. Find the resources where you live. They're there. And there may be a telemedicine option. For example, Be Well Texas, for the entire state of Texas, we provide low barrier, no cost, um, using telemedicine. And we not only prescribe Suboxone, we ship it to your house. So there are those availabilities, especially with the grant funding that's available out there. Absolutely. I think those are awesome words to remember as we continue to see this evolve. And unfortunately, I have that really unpopular task of carrying this out. But I do want to thank you one more time, Dr. Miramontes, for sharing your time and experience with us. It's been a really rich discussion and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm too bad the authors could get on with us today because they really did a great job. They absolutely did. And hopefully we can have them on in a future edition. It's great to see that they continue to publish and take that time, which we know is no easy feature of publishing from case series all the way to this study. And I would suspect that their protocols are going to continue to evolve as they learn through this implementation process. So again, huge kudos to the authors for this work. And thank you all as the audience for being here with us. I do have a couple of reminders before we go. I want to remind you that there is going to be a special edition of this Journal Club podcast called Let's Talk About Sex and Gender. We'll be looking at disparities in EMS care. There is a recently published scoping review in pre-hospital emergency care that the authors will be present and talking about what they found. We'll also be back with the education version of the research podcast on Friday, January 27th. And we will be back here with the second clinical podcast of the year, on Monday, February 13th at noon. So make sure to go to prehospitalcare.org and register for those. Uh, thank you all again and look forward to nerding out again in a near future. Thanks. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this PCRF Journal Club. Please share it with other interested EMS professionals. An archive of past journal clubs can be found at pcrfpodcast.org. You can also find us on Facebook at PCRF at UCLA and on our website, prehospitalcare.org. A special thank you to our sponsors, Limmer Education, providing educational tools for success at every stage of your EMS journey and ESO, dedicated to improving community health and safety through the power of data. Mm -hmm.